one of the frustrating things that will happen to anybody is to live life spending your time, your energy, even resources, your potential, not doing what God actually created you for. When you have a purpose of living, it will affect how you wake up in the morning, what do you intend to do on a daily basis, because your purpose gives you directions. It's driving your life. It controls you the direction of your life. I like the big picture. If all we're doing is looking through life, through our little knot hole, we're going to miss out on so many things. The big picture is that God loves us and calls us in Jesus Christ to, to know him and to follow him and to serve him. The scripture says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so there is God's grand purpose. There is his grand story. We are living in the Acts 29 era. The book of Acts is one of those books that doesn't end. The Holy Spirit that birthed the early church is still at work in the world. There could be disciples right now that could uh, plant a church somewhere in the world that would just uh, explode, uh, Book of Acts style. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, I can have that kind of hope. When you can wrap your puny, my puny mind around that, just a little bit, it'll change your life. It'll change how you view life. It'll give you stamina. It'll give you uh, perseverance. What God's done in the past, He can do it again. What He's done in other places, He can do here. Because you realize it's not my dream, it's His purpose. And that has great, great value. We owe something, you know, to Pastor Smith, who left America at that time, knowing that Sierra Leone is going through, you know, a lot of difficulties. And uh, he came in. He came in at that time. He was there during the war for some time. You know, that was a lot of sacrifice. What can I say? It's like destiny. God brought him to Sierra Leone at that point in time in the history of Sierra Leone for us. When I saw the zeal of Pastor Smith, the preaching, you know, the fire in his soul, in his spirit. I was captivated. You know, I always admire people who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I was really, really touched, moved. There's something within me which I cannot explain that was driving me in that direction. So once I had a, a pastor who is uh, focused, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, who loved God, loved me, I gave my all to it. You know, I can remember when we just get saved, you know, that excitement. Because most of the time when people are too educated, they become logical when it comes to serving God. But for us, you know, we are just exclusive. You know, we want to go to church every day. Whenever there is time for church, you know, everybody is like running. We are running to go to church. People are coming from distance, walking long distance just to go to church. I can still remember that old, rugged, dirty building in Wallace Johnson. You know, all the windows are battered. The, even the seats where we are sitting, they are not good enough. We are using candles. And uh, the, the life, there was life coming out of that building. You know, that's how God works. God likes to do things the way man cannot do it. Pastor Smith, that was one of the things that he was instilling into our spirit, that we are going to go into all the world to preach the gospel. In the minds of many of us, we were like, this is an impossible dream. All of us were from nothing, nothing. If I tell you stories, when we got married, we didn't even have a place to stay. Aruna Bangura was staying with his wife for the first night. 
After the wedding, nowhere to sleep, nowhere to stay. The living room, they just put cardboard around. That's where I was staying for some time. My mother had to give me a room for me to stay after I got married. But past religion in Islam, there is no real love. So I came from a very poor family. My father had four wives, and we have over 15, 16 family members. I was not able to go to school. Nobody talked to me, nobody feed. And so I always spend my time in the ghetto. And so when I gave my life to Jesus, the Lord plants me into a new family. This family start to show me love. This family start to care for me. Pastor Smith always, you know, talk to me, encourage me, feed me, support me financially. At times I don't have things to wear to go to church. He always give me things to wear and that encourage me, that builds up my faith. If God can bring these people into my life, that I think God has a plan and this purpose, I'm going to seek it. Early days with Pastor Smith, man, we are in some kind of a military boot camp. Pastor Smith is just phenomenal. I mean, we enjoyed Jesus with him. He made us feel worth. He gave us his life. And uh, he poured everything in us to realize how important, how valuable we are for God to use us. It was, it's like we, f we, we feel heaven just being around him, preaching, outreaching, coming to our house. He was like a father, he was like an elder brother, it was like everything for us. You know, I grew up without a father. There was no authority figure in my life. Pastor Smith came along and he begins to challenge me. When we went out to outreach at one time, they just called me out to say, Peter, I want you to preach to these people now. I said, oh, what, me? I said, yes, Peter, preach. So I went there and I took the mic and I begin to preach, and that changed everything. I, it's like the Holy Spirit got hold of me. Before that, I was sitting down in the ghetto, smoking weed, not having any purpose, but now I'm preaching the gospel, and I preach, people respond, they lifted their hands to give their life to Christ, and that brought a sense of purpose and direction to me. I begin to discover that maybe this was what I was born to do in this world. We started planting our churches all over Sierra Leone. We crossed over to Liberia, to Guinea, uh, to Banjul, to Senegal, to Togo, to Benin, DRC Congo, Tanzania, to Brussels, uh, to France, uh, to Ivory Coast. You know, God is moving greatly. To take people, to take young men and women from one of the poorest countries in the world uh, and say, I'm going to shape and I'm going to fashion them because they're going to accomplish my purpose, not only in their own nation, but uh, beyond the boundaries of that. Uh, for me, it's one of the greatest privileges in life. And I just sit back and chuckle because uh, this has to be God. I am uh, originally from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. After us, you don't have more than penguins and ice in Antarctica. So it's, it's the end of the world, pretty much. I entered in a, in a military academy when I was 13 years old. So I'm a lieutenant officer from the army. I was an angry person that pretty much destroyed everything in my life. I never see a pattern of people that love one each other. You don't see that in the army. My dad and my mom, they stay together by fighting one to each other a lot, a lot, a lot. So you don't want to be at home. So when I went to church, I was looking at the pastor. The pioneer pastor was Kim Pensinger and Josie over there. And I was looking at them and, and I said, they cannot love one each other. This is a fake kind of thing. They maybe kill one to each other in the house. And, and I start to see that they really love one each other. And the people in church, they take care of one each other. And I never see that before. So that started to 
you know, break my think process, really start to say, I want that. I was working in a job that was very well paid, but God started to put a feeling in my heart to join to McDonald's. It's a lot of young people, and my pastor said, yes, let's, yeah, you can do it. So I went there, and I started witnessing everybody. I met Silvina. She was my boss before, and still today. No, 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 no. Estaba trabajando en McDonald's, eh, conocí a Juan Pablo y él me habló por primera vez de Cristo. Nunca nadie antes, pero me impactó mucho el testimonio de Juan Pablo, lo que yo podía ver en él. Eso tocó mi corazón y dije, quiero lo que él tiene para mí. A los 24 años me salvé y a partir de ahí me afirmé y y realmente nunca más quise volver atrás porque sabía que había un destino claro para mi vida y para mi esposo. After my wife, we brought like 20 teenagers to church. I made an, a strict follow-up on her. <laughs> And one year later, we married. So this year, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. It was something that I never thought that I can have in my life because when you're an angry person, you believe that you always destroy everything and you never will be able to build up something that lasts. So through the grace of God, to build a, a marriage, which is a miracle, and have kids that don't hate me, it's a miracle. What happened to me was that Every time that I witness into people, I felt a fire inside of me. And every time that I was able to bring somebody to church, ooh, that started to create a rush of joy and happiness. And I said, this is so good. I want to do that for my life because it's so amazing what happened inside of me. And see people being helped and transformed like me, ooh, priceless. I don't want to do anything else than, than preach the gospel. And, and that, that was the way that I started to feel the calling. In aquellos días, eh, comenzamos a, a evangelizar, comenzamos a creer que Dios podía hacer un milagro en otras personas también. Así que conocí al pastor Juan Pablo. En aquellos días éramos jóvenes y todos estábamos evangelizando y amábamos a Jesús con todo nuestro corazón. Cuando yo y mi esposa fuimos desafiados para, para pastorear, teníamos 24 años, y fue allí cuando nosotros dijimos, vamos a ponernos en las manos de Dios y vamos a hacer algo bueno. Pensando que íbamos a alcanzar a miles de personas para Cristo. Pero nos encontramos con gente como nosotros, que tenía crisis, dolor, que no entendí el propósito de Dios y en un momento comenzamos a dudar ¿seremos las personas indicadas para hacer el propósito de Dios en Argentina? En el año 2000 Argentina entró en una crisis económica y en aquellos días eh, perdí mi trabajo y la crisis nos pegó tan fuerte que comenzamos a dudar si realmente estábamos haciendo lo correcto pensamos que habíamos fracasado porque no teníamos trabajo, no teníamos dinero y en aquellos días pensábamos que lo más importante era el resultado. Ver, después de una labor tan grande, el fruto, pero nunca lo pudimos ver. Y eso nos desanimó en el corazón. Y decidí en aquel momento, no voy a servirle más a Dios, no voy a predicar más. Y mi corazón se sentía totalmente fracasado. Fabián Godano, por of de ese periodo de struggle. He left the fellowship, and I believe that was for five, six years. That really hurt me because we love Fabian and we had a friendship. That emptiness that you say, man, if they were here, there's so many things that we can do, or this and that. Así que muchas veces los sueños que tenemos en el corazón no se llevan adelante porque pensamos que no somos las personas indicadas. Pensamos que no somos capaces Así que muchas veces enterramos nuestros sueños 
y dejamos que los días pasen y pasen y pasen. To stay focused, to not end up distracted, is a challenge that every person faces. It can be the cares of life, it can be unfulfilled expectations, it could be disappointments. There's this idea that life's trajectory is this unbroken ascent, that we start and then we mount up with wings like as eagles. That's not true. There are times uh, of setback, there are times uh, of failure. A lot of people have been discouraged and to some degree deceived that if I'm not seeing all that I want to see by the time I'm 34 years old, that somehow my life doesn't count. God doesn't ascribe to that. His purposes are fulfilled over the course of an entire lifetime. I was born and raised in Kenya, and I came to France at the age of 20. The hardest moment of my life was when I lost my mother. I asked God, what am I here for? Is life worth living? I mean, why do we have to struggle through all these? I felt alone in this world. In the year 2008, I met Jesus in this church, Eglise Lofar, the Lighthouse Church. And back then, the pastor in charge was Pastor Charlie Foreman. Charlie gave his all for Christ in Marseille. I saw it with my eyes. He and the wife humbled themselves to serve with the church members. And it really touched me. Pastor Warp came down to preach revival. And he told me, we've got a church pastored by Charlie Foreman but uh, we're going to bring him back to the state. Let's see the possibility of getting you over to France. When a leader leaves, the people he leaves behind sometimes find themselves without direction. And so when Charlie was, was leaving, I had planned and told myself that I'll also leave and, 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 and go elsewhere, look for a job elsewhere, maybe in another country. I was still struggling about, is this the will of God? An African coming over to Europe as a missionary it was actually eccentric. It's look abnormal, you know. Having a lot of paperwork to do, having to integrate into the system, to know the language. And I was like, going to France, Pastor Rob, are you sure? I met a young man in the church by the name of Orlando, and he was in his last year studying, and he told me, hey, Pastor, next year I'll finish my course, and I'll be leaving. But if you are coming to take over the church, I will stay and I'm going to walk with you. And I says, yes, God has spoken. I just need one man. From that, it's like God just come and settled my worries. I stayed and God gave me a job. Then found a wife, founded a family. And I look at where I am today and I say, truly, God loves me. And truly, he had a plan for me. God has really helped us. He blessed us with a building. People started coming to church. People started paying, you know, the tithes and the offering. People started getting into ministries. He makes all things beautiful in His time. What we are experiencing today, it all goes back to Pastor Charlie Foreman, investment and sacrifice that he made and I thank God that he did it. And today, I believe there is still hope for this nation. The Lighthouse Church in Marseille has today become a refuge. This church, especially towards immigrants, has become a home to seek Christ and to find rest, where people run to, to, to find a sense of belonging. In the year 2000, I was almost 30 years old. My former pastor was not very supportive, sat me in a chair for almost six years. He felt like I was like a thread or something and don't let me do anything. So God teach me uh, patience and humbleness that just being there, sit down and deal with my pride and many things in my life. So one day out of the blue, he came to me and say, hey, you wanna go to the field? 
I will not help you, but if you want to go, you can go for your own. And I say absolutely yes. Fue un tiempo de muy difícil porque fueron siete años prácticamente no tener un pastor, no tener alguien en quien confiar o quien te pueda guiar. Fue muy difícil. Yo decía, Señor, ¿cuánto tiempo? ¿Cuánto tiempo más eh, vamos a estar así? ¿O, o dónde estás? ¿O dónde, dónde está tu ayuda? No, no reclamándole algo al Señor, pero yo veía que todos tenían un pastor que podían compartir con él y yo no lo tenía durante siete años. Cuando we first came y met Pastor Juan Pablo, uh, he was pioneering in Moonroe, the suburb of Buenos Aires. Things were a little unsettling, you know, in, in the relationship factors with the pastors and things. Uh, you saw the, sadly, divisions that happened because of intimidation or jealousies. You know, we'd like to say ministry-wise that we're immune from those things, but that is a reality. We can know the mechanics, we can know the lingo of what we do, but sometimes the the reality of the struggle, the heart, what builds the heart of what we do is the price that is paid personally. They had heard so much about a way the fellowship is, but have never seen that. They always heard the fellowship was of compassion, of concern, of grace, <laughs> giving a chance. And so I think with Pastor Juan Pablo, that was one of the things that Glued us together. Cuando llegó ya el pastor Mayolo y Erin, su esposa, argentina, nosotros nos aferramos mucho a ellos y, y comenzamos a ver y a conocer una etapa del compañerismo que no conocíamos. The year 2003, when I went to Tucson, Pastor Warner called me and said, I want that you took over your mother church. In my opinion, I was not prepared because I was only three years on the field at that time. It was not a pastor with a lot of experience. And I say, okay, I would took the church, but only with one condition. Say, if you will help me. This is literally what's his answer. You have phone, you have computer, you have fax, and you have pigeons. You know, the pigeons. Say, chest, Call me with that confidence that I will have Pastor Warner behind me, and I move forward. So every time that I have a situation, Pastor Warner, Pastor Warner, and he say, yes, yes, number one, number two, number three, bye. <laughs> But it was so good because he really helped me, and that was so, so critical for that time. Era una iglesia pequeña, pero con gente que quería, tenía la voluntad y corazón de restaurarse. Y nosotros teníamos muchas ganas de, de crecer y de mostrarle a, primeramente a la gente que quería restaurarse quién era el Señor, quién era nuestro compañerismo. The main thing that I started to do with the church was we started to outreach. Because people is, is hurt, I understand, but it's people that is hurt bigger than them outside, that the problems of the people outside the church are bigger than our problems. And that really, really helped the church to understand, hey, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about your pain, it's about Jesus. And, and, and it's a bigger purpose for us. When the older folks start to help me and start to love the new people, everything starts to heal and that starts to create a new atmosphere in the church. It started to create a momentum. And from there, we took off. And right now, we have 30 churches in Argentina. So it's really good. Nuevamente, después de algún tiempo largo, decidí volver a Dios nuevamente. Decidí rendirme a Dios nuevamente y comenzar de nuevo. Y es ahí cuando Dios me dio la nueva oportunidad. One day, by luck, I get his phone and I invite him and say, Hello, Fabian. Say, why you don't come to a rally? Pastor Scott Lamb will be with us. And he came to the rally 
that make him go back to the fellowship and make the discipline, the two years discipline. And after that, we like a church, we planted him in Córdoba. Pastor Juan Pablo me desafió nuevamente y me dijo, siempre hay una nueva oportunidad para seguir adelante. Hubo un proceso increíble que uno no se da cuenta, pero todo lo que me había pasado anteriormente en la vida, las cosas que me tocaron vivir a mí, ahora gente venía con esos mismos problemas, con esas mismas situaciones, y yo sentía que tenía la capacidad de ayudarles, de aconsejarles. Literally that church explode. I think today uh, they planted four or five churches already, and God is moving in a supernatural way there in, in Córdoba, just because God's purpose is bigger than us. His grace is bigger than our mistakes. Some things that we do wrong take more time to get fixed, but God can do it. And once that he, he do it, he's able to use you in another level. I don't really believe that you can show people grace and forgiveness and hope unless you personally have tasted and it's still the most significant thing about your life that God has had unbelievable mercy on me. Uh, you may be able to speak religious words, uh, but they're going to realize that, hey, it's empty. The wellspring is when I've experienced God's mercy. That the song says, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I didn't just leave of my own accord from the church, but I got asked to leave the church <laughs> very nicely by Pastor Warner. I was out of the church for about a year, and it was, it was actually really kind of a boring year. I didn't know what to do with my life. I literally would just like go to work, and come home and just sit there. When I finally got saved again, I wanted to come back to the church. And I remember, uh, nope, I don't want to cry. <laughs> I had a meeting with Pastor Warner scheduled so we could talk about me coming back. And I just remember telling God, even if I had to just plunge toilets for the rest of my life, I, I would do it so that I could be back in my home church serving him. <laughs> and now I get paid to point to us. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay, they're all new. <laughs> so they don't plug up anymore. I came out of a background of uh, drugs, and <laughs> psychedelics and everything. And I didn't communicate with people. I was a hermit sitting alone in my ramshackle apartment. Ministry has brought me out of that and I've developed a love for people. I mean, the people in our church, they're my family, you know? Every service is like a family reunion. <laughs> our first ministry together was children's church, and our kids were raised, you know, in the children's church with us. We had no idea what was gonna be passed down. We had no idea, you know, this is gonna go on our next generation. We were just doing what God wanted us to do and calling us to do. Personally, it's my relationship with God that He has put certain burdens, certain desires, certain inspirations, creativity, things on my heart. And when I follow through with that, when I pursue that, I feel His pleasure. I was right around 18 when we got involved with a skit group called The Little Rascals. We've been married for just under 28 years. and and children's shirts since then. I love having fun for Jesus, and if that means putting on a goofy costume and having an accent and being ridiculous, I'm gonna do it. And if even one kid gets a smile just like that's on your face right now, then it's totally worth it. We're not all called to preach behind a pulpit, but we're all called to minister. You can be a street sweeper to the glory of God, every single believer, who serves uh, the Lord and seeks His purpose is extremely valuable. I know 
that pastoring and where I'm at today is so much because of the years of investment, starting as a young kid, being on F team in children's church, setting up children's church events, being involved in puppets and, and being involved in skits. I have an investment from so many other adults and I feel like a million dollar man because of it. There's times in my life where I struggled with the calling of God. You gotta understand, I was saved for 25 years before I ever went into any kind of full-time ministry. And I went, I was an evangelist for a number of years before I came out to San Diego to pastor. And I was managing a Peter Piper pizza in Tucson. And they paid me very well. I was very blessed there, making very good money. But there was this thing just gnawing at me, is this what you're gonna do with the rest of your life? I can play you know, some tricks on your mind. I don't, I don't know if I see it in you. I don't know if you're called. I don't know if you have the testimony. Roman Guterres has this powerful testimony. Marty Carnegie is just so alive and charismatic. And Jerry Fussell, there's an anointing and he moves in the gifts and I don't see that in you. What's happened over the past couple of years, our church attendance declined and it declined and declined again and we lost almost everybody. I remember one Sunday, you know, we came into church and somebody threw a brick through the front window. At the time, it just made me feel defeated, I think would be a word. I'm not sleeping. I'm not spending as much time with my wife. I'm not spending a lot of time with my kids. It made me kind of feel, uh, in a sense, like a zombie. There's seasons of life and everything happens in God's timing. And so being at that pizza place, God prepared me. I've learned to wait on God and trust in God and see that God had not forsaken me. He was still moving through my life. But like I said, there's a season, a season for everything. And God, there is no doubt, brought me here to South San Diego to pastor this church. God opened up this door for this new building. Uh, this building, we've got 120 chairs plus room for more. It's right on a main strip about a block away from the Metro line. It's probably about three times cheaper when you add in expenses. I remember we did an outreach when we first moved into the building. From that outreach, six people came out to the church. Those six people are still in the church today. Church attendance has risen uh, over 30 people. And all that's happened in less than six months. It's been a total turnaround. There's no way I could have seen this. It's really just been God giving us his favor. Pastor Joaquin was here for 12 years, and it is such a humbling thing to be able to pastor this congregation. They love us, accept us, and we're seeing wonderful things take place in the church. Salvation, healing, deliverances, supernatural jobs, and homes, and people being blessed. These men are, are just rising up. They're saying, Pastor, can we do new songs for song service? Pastor, what do you think about this outreach idea? Pastor, can we go street preach? It's been a, a bit since we street preached. And these men are just alive in God. And I, I'm the blessed one that gets to be here and see all this happening. Jesus loves you. Come to church. Well, one thing you have to remember in this conference video is we're only looking at a small sample of what God's doing. And maybe, yes, we've talked about Sierra Leone, talked about Argentina, but there are dozens and dozens of other places where God's doing the same thing. I'm the first Sri Leonean pastor in the whole of Belgium. My two daughters and my wife have been supportive uh, in all areas of the ministry. We have a lot of people in our church from different African countries like Gambia, Ghana, Nigerians. I can give uh, to people what I have in me. Try to encourage them in the Word of God uh, and tell them everything is not lost. I cannot ease their pain. The only thing I can do for them, I will direct them to Jesus. What I see in Pastor James's life that has transformed me, my life, is his commitment to his God, the things of God, and, and his family. 
I have come to learn that he's a family-oriented person and he has raised the bar for me. The danger of not pursuing God's purpose is regret. You will live with regret. You will miss something. Until you answer to the purpose of God, you will not know how important it is. These are lifetime relationships. And so when you think of uh, purpose, our main purpose in life, in ministry especially, is to give what we are. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So he says, all right, here's a scale. On one side of the scale, the worth of a human soul. On the other side of the scale, you put uh, all that life offers and all that is possible. And he said, what weighs the most is the worth of a soul. And so to not pursue God's purpose is to waste the greatest gift that God's given us, which is the gift of life. I don't want to waste my life. Every individual have a following. People are following you. Every decision that you make, it will affect others. Many of these young men were saved after I left. They demonstrate that this is the highest calling. They're jubilant for those that are going into the harvest field because they understand it's about the souls of man and they continue to hold the torch I believe in life is all about living legacies. I and my wife, we have made a sacrifice already to engage ourselves in this. But could my children take that same pattern that I took? They need to have a better future. Many times we need to ask ourselves this question, whatever you're doing right now, is it of God? Will this help others? to be what God want them to be. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. If Jesus Christ died for me, then I must lay my life for somebody else so that somebody else will pick up the mantle and to run with the flame. Philippians chapter three, which is the apostle Paul's testimony. And essentially he's saying, you know what? When it comes to being a success, in the eyes of the world, I had you all beat hands down. But he said, I came to realize that that was worthless compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so he said, the reward is knowing God. You're never going to get beyond that that is life's greatest treasure. To be a part of something, that's been here next year, 30 years, still moving, still focused, and still flowing in God's purpose. I tell you what, man, you can't beat it. You can't beat it. If he has called you on a certain purpose, on a certain mission, he is going to accompany you through it. And that is the most exciting thing for anyone. And following God's purpose for your life it's the best thing you can ever do. Pastoring in Liberia for the past 16 years, because of God's purpose for my life to meet with these great people, I'm very much grateful. And now God is ushering me into a greater destiny. When I am gone, I will always want people to remember that I was faithful to the Lord Jesus and I love the fellowship.